Uh, for tonight's episode, we read a fan fiction called I Can't Help But Wonder by The Moon Plant. And um, we read about half of it, right? You said it's 10 chapters long, but we read up until chapter five. We'll see how much we can fit in before I have to get William to bed um, because I get to go on some classical literature tangents. <laughs> you do? Yes. Um, but to kind of summarize what this fan fiction is, it takes place not quite where we're at. It takes place at the beginning of the last Olympian, I believe. Mm -hmm. And um, it is essentially like a love letter to Paul Blofus, it feels like. Um, it's painting him and Percy's relationship as the um, the father that Percy needed, the father he never had. And um, it's just so beautiful and wonderful. And I don't remember Paul being an especially developed character in the books. Like, I, I really don't remember these last books at all, to be honest. Um, but I feel like they didn't get into him as much. And like, we know he helped Percy, but we don't really know the finer details of it. Yeah. So one thing that's great with Paul is, and fan fiction in general, like I've read fan fiction forever. Like I started reading it when I was 12, um, which was in 1997. And I, back then you had to find it on like separate web geo cities websites or oh, yeah. like yahoo groups because those were the only nothing existed even fanfiction.net didn't exist yet and so i've read it forever i used to write it like in my head i can remember writing mm -hmm. my own fan fiction of like roll doll books that i was reading when i was like eight or nine and they didn't know that's what i was doing but that's just what i was doing i was putting myself in my favorite stories Mm -hmm. And so fan fiction is so fun because it can take like these characters and just think about it as like, if this really happened or if this, if these people were going actually going through this, this is the kind of thing that would happen. And so the stuff that you know about Paul in the stories in like the books that I remember so far, like we're going to read the next two eventually and yeah. they'll, and I'm sure we'll have different feelings about it as like adults than I did when I read these originally. Um, but at least for Paul, like, I always really liked him because he, I just always remember this one line from one of the books, I think it was The Last Olympian, where um, the only time that Percy went to the same school two years in a row was because of Paul, mm -hmm. that Paul is the teacher at the school at like good high school that's in this story too. And mm -hmm. Paul, and he basically just says it kind of as like a one off line that Paul like talked to the stool, school and like basically made them let him stay there and he was his English teacher for his like sophomore year so he would help him pass that class since that class is obviously the hardest one since he's just dys dyslexic and everything and I remember at the time just being like that is so sweet yeah. and so a story like this that expands on that idea is just really fun. <laughs> yeah it's definitely been a good one so far and um so to kind of jump into it chapter one of this fan fiction is called what your world must be and the setup of the beginning is that paul has just proposed to sally at percy's 15th birthday mm -hmm. and sally has said you know like kind of but like we got to tell you some stuff first so she hasn't quite accepted the proposal and so her and Percy are like around the house whispering and not quite sure how to tell him. And then they finally sit him down. And so when they're sitting him down, he's like going through in his head what they're going to tell him. Number one is he's like, is Percy going to come out to me? But wait, that doesn't make sense because Sally is also a little bit like scared and nervous. That So that doesn't make sense. And then number two is Gabe might not be dead. It, like Gabe might somehow have reappeared because at least to his knowledge Gabe has is a missing person and considered dead mm -hmm. and um I think it's what's interesting about like how this person paints um Paul is that he's acknowledging everything like he's acknowledging Gabe was abusive to both Percy and Sally so they were in physical danger if that is the case and also the legality of it all because if he's still alive that means sally's still married 
and the legal system could be another method for him to abuse Percy and Sally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, I mean, we haven't had, other than Percy, really that much acknowledgement of how abusive Gabe is. It's kind of even throwaway lines when Percy mentions it. Mm -hmm. So for him to be like, no, if Gabe's back, that's super serious and we're gonna have to take care of that. Like, it just right away is like, okay, I love this dude. <laughs> Yeah, like, oh, Paul's Paul's the best. That's right. He's like, let me protect these people, not because I'm like a man and I need to protect the women and the children, but like because it's just the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. Um and I it also is like that's there's like entire fan fictions that have been written about Gabe and about mm -hmm. like the police going trying to go after Sally and like questioning them. There, like, I know I've mentioned this entire, like, genre of, like, Marvel Percy Jackson fan fiction where, like, the Avengers basically have to force him to join them by threatening to arrest people, basically, is the only way to get him to join, because why would, why would he join? That's okay. stupid. <laughs> but anyway, um, but in a lot of those stories, one of the things they bring up is that Gabe is this mysterious missing person and the last person who ever saw him alive was his mother. And she like sold a, a statue that's so lifelike of him that it's like creepy. And that's like the thing they get to get him to join them so that he they leave like Sally alone. <laughs> And but it's just like one of those things that they never talk about it, obviously, in the books, because there's much bigger things happening in the books, it doesn't matter. But somebody who lives in like this world, like the mortal world, like Paul would be worried about to him, that's like the most dangerous thing mm -hmm. is somebody like Gabe, you can't imagine anything else more dangerous than Gabe. And Gabe yeah. is already really dangerous, but still, he's like the starting point. Yeah. <laughs> So and then the third thing that Paul is guessing this could possibly be because um, Poseidon showed up to that 15th birthday is Percy's dad somehow back in the picture. And so what he knows about his dad is he's greeted with a son. Like, correct answer, sir. Correct yeah. answer. Own thoughts like, I don't think much of the dude because he abandoned Sally. Is he's Greek and he's been at, showed up to that 15th birthday is Percy's dad's somehow back in the picture. And so what he knows about his dad is he's Greek and he's been at sea for a long time. And he, he even says in his own thoughts, like, I don't think much of the dude because he abandoned Sally when she was a teenager with a son. Like, correct answer, sir. Correct yeah. answer. That's like, that's why I don't give Poseidon credit for literally anything at all is that like you knew what would happen bro like you knew if that Sally would get pregnant likely and you knew what would happen to her life and what you would put that kid through and you just did it anyway because you just don't care enough I guess yeah. and so I'm like you little bitch <laughs> like <laughs> and so I love that Paul the thing that is so great about the way this story depicts Paul and is honestly how Paul is in the books too is that he doesn't like the same people that you as the audience don't like, but for like completely different reasons than you would in the book. But everything he thinks is like completely right on. Like, I don't trust Poseidon because he's like an emotionally neglectful and like abandoned his own child. And it's like, thank you, sir, for thinking that already without even knowing that he is also a god and did it in a double sort of way. <laughs> yeah. yeah and so he questions like because he abandoned them does he have parental rights does he have custody like is he gonna take percy away i don't want him to take percy away um but that also got me questioning like how does that work with birth certificates i know this is a detail that doesn't really matter to the story so it's not in there but like who did sally put on percy's birth certificate or did she just leave it blank if a child is born to a goddess how does that work? How do they get a birth certificate and social security number and all of that? Because having done a home birth, like I know that it, it's, a, it's more complicated if you don't go through a hospital, the traditional route and have people automatically doing it. Like we had to go and schedule appointments at the social security office. And like, we had to have the midwife there be like, yes, this child was born and here are all the medical records I took. 
And because I wasn't married at the time too, Jake had to sign a special affidavit, like I am the father. Yeah. Sorry, somebody is in my com in my comments saying that I think she just left it blank, but with Annabeth, I don't even know. <laughs> that, yeah. was, that was what I was the entire time you were talking. I was like, what about Annabeth though? Like it's literally just like boop. Yeah, well not just Anna like literally anybody who is born <laughs> of a goddess. Like, how do you explain that? <laughs> I don't even know. I like only can imagine that they they somehow used the mist to like just come up with a birth certificate or get somebody to just make them one and just like hand wave every time somebody thinks about it too hard. That yeah. there's like, no documentation anywhere ever that this birth even ever happened, that this goddess was even pregnant because she just like popped out of her head and into existence. <laughs> Yeah, so, um, I mean, it's it's a detail that, of course, for YA fiction, they're not going to get into. But, like, yeah, I, I mean, maybe there's some sort of, you know, mythological figure in birth records <laughs> in every city or something like that. Same person uh, in my comments, Sky is saying that Hermes' second job is forging all the birth certificates. Oh my gosh, that would make sense. He would, he would be the one to do it and come up with, like, really interesting stories about what he thinks what he could say happened to explain why there isn't any for any of these people yeah <laughs> um but then we get to they finally reveal what it is and um you know percy and sally are kind of like waiting to see how he's gonna react to it and paul doesn't exactly know how to react to it but he's like okay but i trust the two of you so um if you guys say that this is how it is if there's monsters you're a demigod. The Greek gods actually exist. Then I, I guess it's true. And he just goes with it. Um, which, like, I don't. I, I mean, you have to wonder if someone actually did that in real life. What you would think, you know? Yeah. I, yeah. My favorite part of the first chapter of this story is when, um, when he's like, I thought that you guys were gonna have like a much different talk, like something about like. Percy's sexuality and Percy's like what <laughs> like he's so, just so shocked because he just knows what he's gonna say and he doesn't even think they just can't he especially can't think about like how somebody on the outside of everything would think about it and it's like that is the last thing on his mind <laughs> yeah. is, is anything having to do with any of that <laughs> yeah I mean like it's you have to wonder if there's there's been questions that he's had all along about Percy, like why does he suddenly disappear and then come back all bruised and beaten up? Like what actually happened with him? I know he doesn't know the full details of his school history, but at this point he has to know a little, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and why is he gone most of the year? Why does Sally seem worried about him all the time? There had to have been questions. So, I mean, even though, if somebody in real life were to say these things to you, you'd be like, you're insane. What are you talking about? <laughs> I I do, I can kind of see how he's like, you know what? Maybe this does explain everything that I've been wondering. And it's also a thing of he's known Sally and also by extension, Percy long enough at this point to know that they're not the type of people to like make something like this up or be like, making fun of him or teasing him with this or being like severely mentally ill where they're like hallucinating this stuff or anything like that like sally is a very like grounded person in general and so it's like i already know you guys and so if you guys are saying this i'm kind of have no choice but to believe it and if it doesn't make me want to run away screaming because i like you both too much then i guess i'm just gonna go with this because one of my favorite things about this story is just the little moments he has where he's like thinking about stuff like this stuff being real and it's just like this is so weird <laughs> but he also just thinks about it in a very like paul sort of way and i don't know how to put it other than that like totally removed from this world and it's just thinking about what can i do to make percy's life easier mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's another continual theme through it, which, like, is why I think this is such a love note to Paul in general as a character. Um, so that's kind of, like, what we get in the first chapter. 
chapter two is called Sing In Me Muse, and it kind of brings us into more of the teacher-student relationship that they have. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, this confused me because, like, they say Percy's in Paul's class, but then in another chapter, he's in Mr. Boring's class. So, so yeah, for years. One thing I can explain about one of the things that's really fun about fan fiction is that it has its own sort of like style and and like certain stories have like different things that they just do. And mm -hmm. when you don't read it very often or you haven't read it very much at all, you just don't know these things. So usually when for like one shot stories like this one, they don't go in chronological order. They're just <laughs> like random stories that take place at different times. And so these chapters are like not in chronological order at all oh, okay like, like the third one is from like right after titan's curse basically ended because he references you know what what sally told him about paul at the very end of that book that's like the first time you ever really met paul which is like right after this we just finished reading and so okay. they're they're kind they kind of go like all over the place like the first five are all from before the the last olympian so we were safe to read those for this but um they're not like chronological in the way that a lot of other stories are and that's just something that all fanfic one shots do that <laughs> but if you don't but if you don't read them often enough that's not something you would know yeah so i guess it, you go where the muse drives you with these stories mm -hmm. yeah so um in this one paul is teaching percy and he's teaching him the odyssey and this is kind of one of the first times he has to face like oh oh shoot this is like his family these myths are real to him he, these monsters are real and um so one of the first kind of things that comes up in this is paul hands him the book but he also hands it or he hands him the book in class like everybody else but then after class he gives him the audiobook because that is one of Percy's accommodations as um, like his IEP for his ADHD and dyslexia. And um, so Percy asks him at that point, like, do I have to go with this translation or can I read my own? And Paul's like, I, I mean, I guess you can read your own. You just need to know the stories, not knowing like the reason why Percy is going to ask for his own but right away paul does acknowledge that poseidon's an antagonist in the odyssey he is the reason why odysseus has so much trouble getting home and um so he even like he talks to percy about it like if this becomes too much let me know um we see in this chapter him offering hall passes so that he doesn't have to be in certain discussions and mm -hmm. it's just it's very sweet because he's acknowledging these things are so real to you that if these discussions and hearing how other people talk about them is going to be a lot, we don't have to have you sit in class. I know that you understand this. Oh, somebody in my chat is asking if Paul knows that Poseidon is his dad. Yes. He does. Because this fan fiction, this, the chapters kind of jump around, there are some of them where he doesn't know, but there are some where he does know. <laughs> That's like the best way I can put it. Like the first... And the first chapter is when he finds out that he is. The second one and the fourth one and the fifth one, he does know. But the third one, I don't think he knows. The third chapter, he wouldn't know yet. Mm -hmm. um, it That's confusing, but that's just how fan fiction is. <laughs> um, so what we learn is that um, Rachel is also in this class. And so her and Percy study together a lot. It's kind of a big thing in this chapter. Um, and when they get back to their house to study together, Percy pulls out his copy of the Odyssey that he was intending to read, which is actually just it in ancient Greek. And Paul is at first like, whoa, you know how to read this? And then Percy has to explain, okay, the reason why I'm dyslexic is because my brain is hardwired for ancient Greek. So the grammatical structures don't make sense to me because I'm thinking in Greek grammatical structures. I think of R's and H's as rows and Ada's. So like, it's hard for me and um, like, I can just read this. Um, and so Paul again, is just like, yeah, you can read that version. I just need to know that you understand it. 
And please write your homework in English because I don't read ancient Greek. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and as somebody who has translated parts of the Odyssey, like, I would die for this skill to be able to sight read like that, to give context to what it's actually like in a, um, in a translation class for classical undergrad, you're not translating the entire thing. So I didn't translate the entire Odyssey. I translated sections of it, like sections of book one sections of i believe it's book eight that has the whole polyphemus part um and i want to say some towards the ending that i also translated and it would take us weeks to get through that our homework would be like translate 10 lines or so and then we'd come to class read them together and if we struggled through any of it we would do that you know like we would we would explain what was going on um and we were also doing other things like um checking the meter because it's a poem and it had a specific meter so yeah like the fact that he's just able to just straight read it is crazy um like also another thing about greek and and latin which is why percy doesn't struggle with latin in my opinion is it's all based off of the endings of the word so the way that you conjugate like verbs in Spanish, for example, and the different endings are the different um, person number. Um, and, you know, like there's also different tenses and stuff. You kind of do that with nouns as well, because there's different endings for different things that they do in the sentence. So like there's the nominative case and that's like the subject of the sentence. And yeah, I could I could talk about that forever, but it's just a lot of it feels like decoding in a way because you have to know this is the root part this is the ending this is what the ending says it means and they could be in whatever order in the sentence that the author wanted to put them so um that's why it's so difficult you you basically have to take apart the the sentences a word at a time um and so let's see um he also mentions when he's talking about this that Greek editions of things are harder to find, which is very true. There are websites where you can find one. I use one all the time. It's called Perseus. And it's actually really cool because um, you can click on the words and it'll tell you like what ending it has on it and all of the meanings and it has multiple dictionaries. But I don't know that it has everything. And also, like, I don't know how accessible that would have been probably back in the Percy Jackson era. Um, but, like, when I am looking for Greek texts for myself, you, Amazon, you know, like, that's the, you have to go with Amazon. They're very rarely at, rare, at used bookstores. And it costs at least $40 a book for an ancient Greek text. So it's not accessible it really isn't um i would have to imagine that percy's probably getting his copies from camp yeah i'm pretty sure that he does and yeah. the thing i like about this there's a lot of stuff i like about this chapter but i i like how it shows that percy is like afraid of paul finding out about something where he will think that he's too weird now and they won't want to talk to him anymore or or want to deal with any of this anymore and there's this whole like thing in all these chapters that percy's afraid that he's going to somehow do or find something out and then his mom isn't going to have like paul in his life anymore mm -hmm. and, um, but that of course never ever happens <laughs> but it's just like cute to see um him like afraid almost to like answer paul's questions yeah <laughs> in this chapter of like like he doesn't tell him at the school that he has an ancient greek version he just like goes to get it and then and then paul sees it and he's like oh that does make sense considering who you are mm -hmm. and everything like that then once he hears the explanation he's like yeah that's fine whatever i don't care like he sounds like every other english teacher in existence that's like i don't care how you do my homework as long as you understand what you're reading mm -hmm that's all I care about. And like, Percy's always like waiting for him to be like, get away from me, strange child. <laughs> yes, or mad at him for whatever reason. And what's yeah. funny is 
Percy did like verbally say, I'm sorry if this one's too weird for you. And Paul's like, finding out that you're multilingual is probably the least weird thing I found out about you. <laughs> Paul is seriously the best that he says that. And like, of course, somebody who lives in New York City, yeah, it like walking down the street in New York City, you hear like, I hear, I haven't been there in so long, but the last time, the few times I've been there, you hear, I hear languages. I don't even know like what language I'm hearing, which is part of the fun of being there is being so immersed in so many different cultures and so yeah being in new york city that's honestly not that weird but it's also just like he's talking about that about his dad being a greek god <laughs> that's just like the way that he looks at it that's why everyone loves paul so much because that's just the personality he has in the books too it's like oh well my my stepson basically is in danger by these people i can't see them but i'm just gonna shoot them anyway Mm -hmm. don't kill my stepson i'll kill you first <laughs> and that's yeah. all that's that's all that matters to him <laughs> yeah um let's see so it kind of jumps time after that and we get an out of context line of percy and rachel talking about poseidon and athena and then um percy is like i'm not gonna comment on that and um you know they're like why and he's, he's like because athena already doesn't like me <laughs> and um paul's just like wait a second athena doesn't like you <laughs> the goddess of like logic and like warfare doesn't like my stepson <laughs> like, like why why doesn't he like this sweet child <laughs> and, and percy has to explain like oh she doesn't like that i'm friends with her daughter annabeth and he's like okay but like why <laughs> The, the best part when when they get past like Paul being like does she care about all of her kids friends and Sally's just like no it's just specific to Percy this time and he's just like this is so weird why would anybody not like Percy the line that like every once in a while when you read like fan fiction you can like when you get like the what the author's opinions are about something and it's so great when they have the same opinion as you and so the one line from this part was when Paul is thinking, like, Athena wouldn't take out her own personal issues and project them onto Percy, wouldn't she? Like, she would never do something like that. <laughs> that was when I was reading this story. I was like, subscribe, was, which is when you get, like, an email whenever a new chapter comes out. I'm like, <laughs> like I love this story. because I'm like, thank you for that author person. I appreciate you. <laughs> yeah, we, we just talked about this because it was at the very end of Titan's Curse. Like, he spent that whole book saving your daughter's life, and you're going to advocate for offing him because he might be dangerous. Um, just Athena oh. is the ultimate, like, Karen mom in that book of, like, you are the problem because it couldn't be my precious little daughter. And it's like, you know it's your precious little daughter. Just shut the fuck up. Mm-hmm. Like, just stop, just go away. <laughs> and so it's just perfect that Paul is like, she wouldn't be that stupid, would she? And it's like, yes, she would be. <laughs> but I, I appreciate that you don't, you don't want to think that she would be like that because it doesn't actually make any sense. <laughs> um, so they get to discussing the Odyssey a bit and they're talking specifically about the Polyphemus part and percy starts over explaining the utis pun which utis is um greek for nobody and it's that whole you know like odysseus tells polyphemus that his name is nobody and so when he actually hurts him and polyphemus is crying out to the other cyclopes he's like nobody's hurting me and they're like okay if nobody's hurting you like we're gonna go <laughs> um, <laughs> and, um so Rachel asked the question that I actually asked this question myself too. I was like, is, was Utis like an actual name back then? Like, why did he fall for that? And the answer is Cyclopes are stupid. And also it's just supposed to be a pun. It's supposed to be a joke. And, um, so yeah, like he starts trying to over explain it. And then he just is like, yeah, it's a pun. It's a joke. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> That part is when, when I was reading this, that I was like, this author is definitely neurodivergent mm -hmm. in some sort of way, which became more evident as I read more chapters. But I was, because that's exactly what we sound like of how Percy just is 
trying to explain that it's a pun and also polyphemus is very stupid and he just like stops and he's like never mind <laughs> i'm never going to explain this the right way just know it's just it's a pun yeah but yeah, it, it also comes like, out here that he's met polyphemus and that was in sea of monsters he actually had to trick him and and fight him essentially in his own way and so um because Paul finds out that he's actually met him, he gives him a note for class the next day. And I thought that that was like so sweet. It's just like, yeah, this wasn't great. And I, he doesn't even know the full story yet. He doesn't know that Percy feels bad that he had to betray him. Like the whole entire sea of monsters is Percy, you know, like, and, and Tyson. But here we have another Cyclope brother or Cyclops brother who like he has to like really betray and just make even more angry and so you can tell like in Sea of Monsters even though it doesn't really come up again that that probably stuck with him you know like the fact that here that here's the one Cyclops I'm protecting and loving as a brother but I have this other brother who I fucked over and I don't feel great about it yeah and it's also why like Paul is the best ever and like people like just cry thinking about him. Like every once in a while I see posts on TikTok of people just posting like quotes from the books about Paul and the comments are just people crying. <laughs> is that like he hears that Percy has met Polythemus and Percy has interacted with him before and his reaction is like, oh, being in class would probably be really uncomfortable for you to listen to like your classmates talk about polythemus and your dad this way i don't want you to feel bad i don't want you to have to listen to people talking about these people you actually know in this way you obviously understand this more than anyone else so i'm gonna try to protect you and you can leave if you want to so that you don't have to sit here and just like take that when you don't have to I don't know that any teacher has ever in the history of Percy's life ever done something like that before to like look at him like an actual person and be like, yeah, this would make you really uncomfortable. You don't have to sit through it if you don't want to. Mm -hmm. And it's just like such like a Paul way to look at things that instead of like fanboying or whatever and being like, oh my God, you've met these like these like historical figures that I didn't even think was real that I've been reading books about that I got an entire degree about. I want to know everything that you know about them. Like even Rachel does that a little bit in this chapter with him sometimes where she like almost, she doesn't realize that he's like getting upset talking about polythemus and stuff. And like Sally has to like cut the conversation off. But with Paul, he's like, oh, that would be really upsetting for him. So let me do something to take him out of this. And yeah. it's just like, you're just reading, you're like, oh my God, he's the yeah. best. Like, I, I'm so glad that Percy has somebody like this. And whenever I read these stories about Paul and Percy, which I have a lot of them, obviously, because I'm me, um, I'm like, wow, it must be really nice to have a nice dad. <laughs> because this sounds pretty nice to have somebody like that doing stuff like that for you instead of, you know, the other way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, what's the statistic I heard recently about dads? Um, it was something like... I want to say in the boomer generation, something like 40% of dads had never changed a diaper. And in our generation, it's like 3%. You just know, even though Paul's probably like a Gen X, he's he's probably one of those dudes who's like, yeah, I'm going to change the diaper because you're tired and it's my baby too. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, it's just, there's so much about him that is everything you want in a dad and as both of us have our own daddy issues in our own way it's just like it's hard to imagine a man being that sweet yeah i know there are men that are like that i, mean, I have like i've got one here at home yeah. but i didn't experience him as a father yeah i've heard of i've heard of them and i've interacted with some men that are sometimes like that even mm -hmm. though they're not like they're obviously not my dad but it's still like like i know there are people like that out there but they almost feel like unicorns because mm -hmm. not really been exposed to them as much as other people 
Yeah, like with with Jake, when I was pregnant with William, I remember telling him, I don't know what dads do because like I have zero memories of my parents being together and living in the same house. My dad was always just weekend custody at any point that I was able to remember. So I like literally, I did not know what dads do. I was like, what is, what, what do you do? Like, what's your role? What are you supposed to do here? And he's just like, let me show you. And um, I mean, it's, it's so crazy to be like, wow, what would my life have been like if I had had this, if I had had somebody around looking out for me like this, somebody who like wants to protect me like this. This is crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and for me, I, <laughs> I've i always used fan fiction to not only read things about stuff that I'm going through, but I also use it as a way to like read thing, situations that I could think that I could wind up one day end up being in. And so I like read them to almost see how the characters that have a similar life as me would like react to these sort of situations or to know what to do. Like, I don't do this as much in Percy Jackson fanfic, a little bit with like Paul and Percy, but there's other one, other genres that I read fanfiction for that I'm literally like reading it to figure out how you're supposed to act around like having a, like I have a niece and I don't know what is like, normal i guess or good or bad or like where the boundary line is for just like normal things of like affection or whatever like i have no idea and so i'm always like second guessing myself i'm like am i being inappropriate am i not and i'll like read these stories where characters are like helping out a younger kid and i'm like oh that's how that's supposed to be and i'm like okay i feel better about that because i that's what i thought it was but i have absolutely no idea <laughs> And so I have to like read these things as a safe way to figure out how, because that's not something you can really, most of the time you can't go up to somebody and ask them something like that because they don't, they will think that you're very weird. If you mm -hmm. go up to somebody and be like, be like, I feel like this is the right way to like, I feel like it's okay to like console a kid this way, but can you tell me if, if that's okay, or if I'm being like creepy or weird without thinking that I am creepy or weird. <laughs> It's just that my dad was a like a full blown predator, and so I don't know how you're actually supposed to act around kids like that. And this yeah, is the way to find out. Well, and your mom was in that situation too, so I'm sure she didn't act the way that she would have had she had a better partner. Yeah, uh, and my mom also had a predator dad. Like her dad was was very similar. To, she got married to my dad because of that stuff like repeating and so her dad was her dad wasn't any better and so she didn't she never like you know learned that stuff of like what was right or what was wrong and so she wouldn't have any idea either <laughs> yeah i have to wonder if the person who wrote this fan fiction has a good dad i hope so i i uh, a lot of times fan fiction like this is written by people who don't that are like that are like living out like fantasies of um having daddy issues <laughs> but i hope that it's not every once in a while it isn't but most of the time that's what it's there for that's what yeah. most people read it for and that's what most people write it for is that sort of like um wish fulfillment <laughs> yeah um so the next thing that kind of happens in this fan fiction we i think it was another time jump where Percy leaves on a mission. He doesn't tell them where he's going. And um, he just, he's like, I'll be back on Sunday. He comes back, he has singed clothes, he has bruised ribs. And like the one thing he says about what he was gone, and I have to assume this is what he was doing. He's like, yeah, the sun cattle, they're bright red, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> and I love that Paul is just like, thank you for that information, Percy. And like, doesn't push him anymore doesn't ask him why he knows that doesn't ask him what he's doing because he's like i can tell that he just he doesn't want to talk about what he was doing he just wants to be able to be a normal kid for a while with me and his mom and just talking about homework and high school and being a normal teenager <laughs> yeah and as a normal teenager i mean i mean it's sort of normal is 
we we find out in these chapters the way that they characterize Percy is that he loves reading ancient Greek myths. And as much as he's not a huge reader and he's not like super into the academic side of it, he loves that specific part of it. He wants to absorb the stories, which of course any demigod is going to want to because you're going to be up against those same monsters. You're dealing with those same gods like and it it gives you kind of a blueprint of what to do and what not to do. So it's it's somewhat survival for him, but it's also just like, oh, this is my entire family. Mm -hmm. And Percy kind of strikes me as somebody who, if he didn't have dyslexia, would read a lot more. Mm -hmm. Because that's really the thing that stops him. Because even within like the, the books, when he hears like a myth or a story or whatever, he immediately then knows, like he can figure out very quickly kind of, how to respond to them and that's just basic reading comprehension mm -hmm. not everybody has that skill like the reason why like um media literacy has become like this whole like insult <laughs> as of late is because there is a there is a big lack of media literacy in general mm -hmm. um he doesn't have that lack though it's just purely that it's so hard for him to read that he doesn't do it as much, but if he could, he would be a lot better at it. But even without that, he still understands this stuff very well. Yeah, he strikes me more as the type that he would be reading fiction, he would be reading fantasy, and it's because it's the love of story that's driving him here. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's, that's what kept me going. The reason I got my degree in classical languages was because I wanted to read those stories and I wanted to read them in their purest form. And the wordplay of it all, the grammatical stuff of it all also is very inspiring if you're a person that loves to write. Mm -hmm. So it it's the reason why I think classics is still around even though it, it is kind of fading out, I hate to say. Um, it's because the stories are that good and there's a reason why we still tell them. It's because they hit on great themes about what it's like to be human, what it's like to exist. And yeah. To be fair, the only reason why classics is dying out is because people with degrees in them besides you are like elitist little bitches and don't let people just enjoy them. They like are so controlling of them that they, they would rather control them than to have them actually like survive. Like if they would ever just let that go and realize how ridiculous and pedantic they're being, they would, because there's way more books and movies and stuff coming out about them in the last 20 years or so than there ever, than I can ever remember seeing growing up or anything like that. Mm -hmm. They're like everywhere right now. Um, if you would just like let yourself enjoy it, which is always like the problem with them. Um, I was going to say something and I already forgot what I was going to say. Oh, the part in the story where where um, Rachel is where he asked Rachel like where 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 where's Percy and Rachel's like always oh, going after hellhounds and he just stops and Paul stops and he's like how does she, how does she know what a hellhound is <laughs> and he's like you know what never mind <laughs> I don't I don't know the answer to this question but maybe it's best that I don't and I'm not going to push any further. <laughs> That's the exact sort of person that you need around Sally and Percy is somebody who doesn't like push too far and just kind of lets things lie and not think about them all too much. Yeah, if he asks too many questions here, there's so much to explain. There's thousands of years of history and mythology that, you know, you bring into it. And I'm sure there's stuff that even Percy and the rest of the demigods haven't connected the dots on because we know that the myths are linked to history. Like we know specifically World War II, um, but you have to imagine every war has probably been fought with demigods then in this universe and that, um, you know, every leader may be divine or partially divine or may see through the mist um, that it, it goes in all levels of government, it goes in all countries, um, which like, yeah, it's, it, I'm, it's why Rick is able to build a universe around all of this. But I mean, there's, there's probably so much to it that even Percy doesn't understand. Mm -hmm. 
And he doesn't want to understand. Yeah. Percy's <laughs> like, I'm just going to know as much as I need to know to survive. Like, yeah. I, my brain will explode if I know more than I know right now. And already what I know right now is too much. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that brings us to chapter three, which is if, um, is it if we're like each other? I can't read my own handwriting. If we're like each other, I think is what it's called. And the setup for this chapter is Percy just got home from school and he gets a call from his mom who's like, I'm going to be home late for dinner. And can you make dinner? Oh, by the way, you remember Paul's coming over, right? And so Percy has to be okay with like being alone with Paul for a little while while his mom's not there. And he's he's pretty much thinking like, okay, this guy's not like Gabe. My mom's assuring me he's not like Gabe. So I think I'm okay with this. But um, he slowly builds up his nerves as the time goes on. Um, so, Paul comes and one of the first things he brings blueberries because he's like, I know you guys like blueberries because them and their blue food. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's it's one of those things It's such a little detail, but it's so sweet that he's like observe the blue food thing. Yeah, and he's like, oh, you guys will eat this, right? Yeah, probably. <laughs> so I just brought it. <laughs> yeah, and we kind of get a little like of Percy's normal PTSD here. Cause like, of course he has PTSD with all of the dramatic stuff that's happened with monsters, but we don't really get too much of the Gabe PTSD. And so he's a bit jumpy when he's alone with Paul. And um, like one of the first ways that this expresses itself is like when he's inviting him to walk to the kitchen, he doesn't want to walk in front of Paul because he doesn't want to turn his back to him. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I love this. I love this chapter because literally every single thing Percy does is every single thing I do <laughs> all like with around like new people, especially like I remember um, when a couple years ago when my mom started dating somebody um, I that I did the exact same sort of thing. I still am sometimes like that around that guy, even though he's a very nice guy and has never done anything horrible or bad or anything. He's a sweetheart, but there's still this part of me that's always like, like around him because it's just, what do you do after being around like a male figure that bad besides okay. like have a hard time being completely sure. And so I just remember so many times of doing stuff like that around people that I don't know, especially guys, but I even do it around girls that I don't know of like, being nervous about what to say or what to do or like not wanting to say anything too weird or too strange but being very aware of how awkward everything is because you don't know what to say or what to do and like kind of being on high alert that ptsd like hypervigilance where you're like jumping about everything and you just find yourself rambling about things that don't matter but you don't know what to do um this was like a very accurate depiction of that of um especially the part when um when he like cuts off paul when paul is asking like how they're gonna make dinner and he just like cuts him off like in an adhd way and says like oh no you don't use the stove we just put everything in the rice cooker and like his reaction to that is being scared and being like please don't get mad at me because i like cut you off and Paul is just like, oh, okay, that's cool that you guys can make a recipe like like this, where you only have to use a rice cooker. That's that's interesting, and like that's the kind of stuff with like PT, especially like complex PTSD stuff that is so weird. Is that you're having like several mental breakdowns in your head, and the other person has no idea that mm -hmm. that's happening. <laughs> like absolutely none. <laughs> like Paul is like, this conversation's going like fine. I have something of interest to talk this to this kid about, which is just like this recipe, everything's going great. And Percy inside his head is like expecting Paul to su suddenly start screaming at him or hit him or something just because he interrupted him. Yeah. But that's the kind of thing that happens when you're around someone that is abusive. That's how quick it can be. And so yeah. he's just like waiting for that to happen and it never ever happens with with paul but it's just very sweet to see him trying anyway and just like trying to hold in the panic 
<laughs> and he, he can't hold it in anymore once he realizes he made a big mistake, which is he's making chicken and he didn't defrost the chicken first. And so he's like, the panic starts to come out in a way that Paul can now notice it. And Paul's like, it's, it's cool. I'll go defrost it in the microwave. We got this. Um, but like, that's the moment where you really see Percy lose it, like, externally as well. Yeah, and starts like hyperventilating and panicking and ugh. I like I used to have panic attacks. I'm not exaggerating. I feel like people think I exaggerate when I say things like this, but I'm not. I used to have a panic attack every single day for like most of my life. I didn't know that they were panic attacks because I was just existing, but I was I had a panic attack almost every day. I haven't had I don't have them anymore. Mm-hmm. Like that. Those finally stopped like that a couple years ago, um, but I'm 39, <laughs> so it was like that for at least like 35, 36 years or something of my life. Ironically, I had a situation very similar to this happen today where at my job, they made us listen to something that was like super duper like triggering to most people, but especially to, to me, it was really hard. It was listening to like a phone call of somebody who called in who was like wanting to unalive themselves mm-hmm. because I guess this job that I just started sometimes people call in and say that mm-hmm. and so the thing that was really triggering for me personally was listening to somebody who sounded exactly like I did a couple of years ago like five years ago at this point I like literally like just like threw my headphones off because I couldn't listen to them and was like out of it for the next hour after that and was like I'm not going to remember anything that I'm learning um at all (laughs) like this is like but like I was like trying so hard like I was feeling that feeling you get when you're trying when you're starting to panic where you like can't breathe and your chest starts to hurt a little bit and you can feel yourself doing it but you're like I'm not supposed to be doing this right now it was I was doing that and I was like oh yeah that's exactly what Percy is doing right here in his kitchen because he forgot to dethaw chicken and that like makes him this scared like thanks Gabe yeah that's all it takes to make you this this scared though like I've been scared like this over over I've been I've had panic attacks for hours on end because a pizza delivery person knocks on my door and I didn't know they would be there mm-hmm. so uh this is to me this makes sense but to most people that's that's like a it's interesting when you read this story because Paul is someone who clearly doesn't have that sort of trauma in his life because like when Percy is like I don't want to talk about school don't ask me about school and they st- when Paul is like can we like set boundaries to make this easier on you and he thinks that the reason why Percy doesn't want to talk about school is because something happened at school that was bad or something Mm-hmm. And he doesn't want to tell Paul about it because he doesn't trust. Um, okay. What? <laughs> I don't know. And he, and like so he doesn't trust Paul, and so he he thinks he does something bad happen, and he tells Sally ask him about this later. But in reality, it's just like he's he's like anxious about talking to school about school with an with a teacher, mm-hmm. and he doesn't want it tell he thinks that paul will realize that he's stupid Mm -hmm. like that doesn't even occur to paul at all that it could be that he just thinks oh something happened with some kid at school today and percy's like no i'm just terrified of talking to him about school because i don't want him to find out that i'm an idiot and sally's like that will never happen (laughs) well not even just that but he at this point doesn't know the history of how many schools he's been expelled from why he's been expelled from them and like that he's never really had help with his accommodations at all um so it's it's all of those things combined and so yeah paul noticing this was like let's set ground rules percy's first one was don't talk about school but the second one percy internally is like how do i say don't yell at me or don't hit me without saying it and the way he chooses to phrase it is i don't like loud noises and don't touch me (laughs) like yeah that's the perfect way to put like i have complex ptsd is like don't touch me and i don't like loud noises because that's what i tell people about me too like don't touch me unless i tell you it's okay and 
I really, I don't like loud noises. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so that, that's a, he's, I like the way that Percy puts it in the story of like, how can I tell him this without like sounding concerning? Because mm -hmm. you're like aware that how you feel is concerning to other people and you don't want them to know about it. Yeah. And so he's like, how do I tell him that, that like Gabe hit me without saying that like Gabe hit me? Um, yeah. This is a safe way to do that. Um, but also reading this story, I was like, huh. So it is possible for male figures in your life to like recognize that you're upset about something and be like how can i make this easier for you let me set boundaries and you don't have to explain them to me you just tell me what you want and i just do it mm -hmm. is that something people do <laughs> uh, i think it's something that people that are trauma informed do and at least this version of paul is very very trauma informed <laughs> and also honestly this story too if you ever have a teenager in your life at all this would be a good way to talk to them is to never push them about anything and just let them decide what they want to tell you and when they want to tell you it um mm -hmm. i do that even with like the kids who message me sometimes from my videos or whatever like they just kind of tell me like fragments about their life and i don't like push them ever about telling me more even if i'm curious about it I just kind of let them tell me what they want and they'll come back if they ever want to tell me anything else, but it's, they'll like actually talk to you more if you, but as soon as you start asking them more questions, they'll, they're going to shut down. Like even like a normal teenager would shut down over something like that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. Like I, back when I did more content on my like enmeshment with my mom, I, I did get people. And to be honest, like I, I do go with the strategy of asking questions sometimes and some people are responsive to it and some aren't, but mostly like, it's mostly been with adults, thankfully, where it's like, okay, you're asking me about these things. Like, let's talk this through together kind of questions more so than like, I need you to tell me everything. Mm -hmm. um, it'll be like, well, how about this one specific thing? Like, um, and that'll lead you know, I'll try to lead the discussion that way. But um, Paul is very careful about how he words things. And it's it's really apparent that he's just trying to make sure that this works with Percy and that he actually does care about him already, even though he doesn't know him very well. Like this is in this chapter, it's literally the first time they've ever been on their own. Mm -hmm. And I will say Paul does a good job of something I do even with like the videos that I make about Luke, where when kids are responding to me, I'll like ask them a question and it, it's just purely like a question. Like they mm -hmm. can decide not to answer if they want. And it's not even me telling them what to think or what I think or what's right or what's not right. I'm just trying to get them to think about something a little bit. And mm -hmm. it, when you just like leave it open to them to decide. And so that's basically what Paul is doing here is like, do you want to make dinner with me? Do you want me to leave? Because I will leave right now. And I'm like, mm -hmm. if you don't want me to leave, what do you want to talk about? Do you, I will never ask you about school ever if you don't want me to. Otherwise, we can figure out something else to talk about. And it, like it immediately is rewarded because because Percy starts talking to him about like camp stuff with mm -hmm. like you know and starts talking to him because he shows that he's a safe person that he can feel okay with in his house um after spending the last year and a half finally feeling safe after Gabe was gone yeah yeah so um and it's it's funny because like school would be the one place where like they could level with each other since Paul's a teacher and Percy is a student but um, so then he's like, OK, do you like board games? Like he's just trying to, to grasp onto stuff. And that's yeah. Percy talks about camp. He's like, we play something called Evil Uno. He's like, ooh, what's what's Evil Uno? And Percy's like, oh, last time someone went to the infirmary. So um, we probably shouldn't play that. Let's play regular Uno. <laughs> but, Actually, one yeah. thing with this chapter I wanted to ask you, because I have I have no life experience with this. Um, my dad did not allow my mom to like date other people. 
Mm -hmm. So, um, did this remind you at all of you meeting your mom's people? Um, so there's, there's a few boyfriends that stick out. I mean, one was so, I was so young when I met one of her very long-term boyfriends that I really don't remember how we interacted and he tried to buy my affection with puppies, but, um, there was also, um, so let's see, there's this guy that she dated when I was about 14 and, um, she cougared it out that time. He was a bit younger than her and um he was a musician and at the time i wanted to be a musician i'm i'm not good at singing or guitar which is what i was trying to do at 13 but um you know we we bonded over that stuff and um i remember him taking me out to the theater like the three of us saw the spongebob movie in theater i can't even tell you how many times like <laughs> And, and IMAX theater too. Um, and like, I remember seeing the Willy Wonka movie with Johnny Depp with him. Um, mm -hmm. So like, we had some alone moments where it was like, yeah, let's talk about music. We both like classic rock. Okay, cool. Um, my mom's current husband, um, my alone moments with him are more awkward, but I would also call him a better guy because the musician guy dumped my mom over text message. Um, but the, uh, her current husband is a great guy. Like, I honestly wish he had been in our lives longer, but to be honest, he's like a child free dude. And so it took him a long time to work up the courage of like, I'm going to date this single mom who has two children. And, um, he bonded right away with my brother over martial arts because he is a former martial artist and my brother, um, practices a few different martial arts. So they had that going together. They took some classes together and he really, I feel like he built that relationship up with Michael first. With me, I think he had a harder time with me and it was a lot more awkward. Like he did, we did have alone moments, but it was mostly like very business, you know, like, oh, Mandy needs a ride to this place. Can you give her a ride kind of deal? And it was like, we would also talk about music because I, I've always had like an older taste in music. And so it was like, yeah, we like some of the same bands, cool. Um, but um, the the only moments where he was like super sweet to me and we really bonded were um, when I had already moved out and I was pregnant with William and he was asking like, is it okay if I ask your mom to marry me? And um, like, those were the moments that I actually was like, okay, this is a good dude. Like, we're gonna go with this. Um, it was a lot more clunky though than what seems to be happening with Paul and Percy in these chapters. That's true. Yeah. That's at least something. Yeah, I will say, so the long-term boyfriend, me and my brother hated him. And after that, my mom kind of vowed like, guys that my children don't like are off limits, um, which is the one good thing about like how our relationship was back then. Um, I've, I've said this to a few single moms, like I really do think it's important that if you're bringing somebody into that family system, it's not like let your kids dictate who you date, but they should at least be able to get along. You know, like it shouldn't be like, I hate this dude, but you're gonna marry him anyways. Like that's when it's really shitty. But um, if it's the kind of situation, even where it's a little bit awkward, like it is with me and my current stepdad, um, that's that's manageable you know it's a lot more manageable than i don't want to be around you <laughs> yeah and honestly when it comes to your stepdad the reason why it's awkward isn't really him it's like decisions that your mom makes mm -hmm. he's just like there when those decisions are happening but he doesn't have anything to do with them and i don't even from the stories you've told me he doesn't even seem like he fully even like would have enough information to know like why those things would be like a problem um yeah i have to wonder if i looked like a crazy person to him at times like the one thing that he witnessed that i kind of wish he didn't was um so my grandma goes in and out of contact with my mom and she was no contact for a very long period including their marriage like when they got married and um so she tried to weasel her way back in when my uncle died a couple years later and 
my mom was like, she went from this lady doesn't talk to me to I'm going to go stay the night at her house because her child just died and I want to be there for my mom. And I was like, all the things this lady has done to you, why the hell are you going over there? You're grieving too. Stay home with your husband where you're safe. What the fuck are you doing? Like I was yelling at her, full on yelling. And he's just like downstairs. And when I walked out because she was still packing and still like, yeah, I'm going to go. I was like, don't fucking let her leave. And he's like, I can't do anything about it, but I 100% agree with you. And that's like the one moment of understanding we had in that. It, but I, I'm sure he was like, oh my gosh, what did I get myself into? I wonder that about my mom's guy. I don't know what to call him now. Like, what do you call people who date when they're in their like late 60s and they're going to turn 70 in two years? Oh my um, God calling them boyfriend girlfriend sounds really stupid but even though like they live together they've been dating for many years but they're not they're not married and they're not going to get married um so whatever i don't know what to call him but i do wonder like like <laughs> i always just wondered like when my mom and i started talking last year if he was like afraid to talk to me at first because it was just like I was there and then all of a sudden I was gone and it was I just like wonder like what did my mom say when I was not there to like explain why I suddenly wasn't there um or like what did he think about any of that stuff like and like now that I'm back it does he ever like wonder <laughs> like yeah. what, the, what the fuck happened <laughs> in like these you know the five years in between like he's not gonna he's not gonna ask but um, but I just wonder, like, from the outside, like, very much like this sort of story, like, what does it look like when you're on the outside and you don't know any of these people? <laughs> to get back onto the story, um, he told Paul about Evil Uno. When Sally walks in, they're playing Uno, and um, he, she met, they, like, mention Evil Uno. She's like, wait, you, that, that's with weapons. Like, you guys aren't playing with weapons, right? <laughs> and they're like, no, we're playing regular Uno. <laughs> Um, and Sally eventually like recaps with Percy after ba Paul leaves and, um, it's just, it's very sweet. Like, you know, Paul, uh, you can tell Percy felt at ease with Paul because he's able to say to his mom, like, yeah, he let me set ground rules. Like it was actually really good. Um, it worked out really well. And, um, that's like the closest Percy gets, I think, to being like, yeah, I love this dude. Yeah. And where his mom, where Sally just asked, like, did he hurt you? And he's like, no, <laughs> like, not at all. I just, I, I just freaked out about school because I didn't want to tell him about how hard school is for me. And she's like, oh, okay. That's yeah. a very, that's a very normal problem to have. Yeah. And she's like, you can tell him on your own time. Like, I'm not going to reveal that, you know, it's, it's your thing to tell, which I also very much appreciate. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Okay, so then we get into chapter four, which is war, which is where I'm going to go on a lot of classical literature writ tangents. So the chapter is called Instead of Men, Jars of Ashes Come Back Home, which I think is in reference to all of the war tragedies that they, they mention in here. So um, the chapter opens up, Paul's kind of sitting there reading and studying, and he is reading Oedipus Rex. And um, we'll get back to Oedipus Rex and why that's important to the story because it comes up a little bit later. But um, Percy's like, oh, are we reading that next? And Paul's like, no, why? He's like, well, I have opinions. There's so many better things we can read. And he mentions a few things. So um, first he mentions Antigone, which is one of the novel or one of the plays that comes after Oedipus because it's his children. And the basic plot to, like, give it too long, didn't read, is after Oedipus self-exiles, um, his two sons jointly rule Thebes. And we have Eteocles and Polynices. And so um, Eteocles, during one of his years of ruling, they were fighting, and he expels his brother from Thebes. And his brother gathers an army and attacks in this kind of civil war that happens, both of them die. Um, and then the next de facto ruler is Jocasta, their mom's brother, Creon. 
and Creon decrees that since Polynices attacked Thebes, like we're not gonna bury him, we're not gonna grieve him, um, it's going to be against the law to give him any sort of funeral services. So Antigone, who happens to be his sister, decides, fuck that, like I'm burying my brother because in Greek, in the Greek school of thought, you don't go to the afterlife if you don't get buried. You're kind of left before um, you get to, I was gonna say Chiron, Charon, um, you know, you don't even get to go on the ferry. You're left before the ferry. And um, so she didn't want that for her brother. She wanted him to be able to go to the afterlife and thought that he deserved that thought that, you know, like what is moral, what is right should go above what is law. And even though like the play is essentially them trying to get her to change her mind, trying to get her to apologize for what she's done or say she was wrong or let them unearth the body. I forget the, the exact like details of it, but they try to give her outs and she doesn't take them. She's like, no, I'm standing on business. You know, like this is what is right and I'm going to keep doing it. And so they decided that they're going to bury her alive in a tomb. But um, King Creon eventually changes his mind is like, you know what, maybe I'm being too harsh. But when they go to the tomb, she's already hung herself. And so, um, you know, like, it's, it's just kind of a like, really sad, a bunch of people also unalive themselves, because like, they're sad that this has happened. So um that's the theme of that and i think for percy the whole you know like what is moral what is right in standing up for that like antigone is a hero in a sense and it's as much of a hero that a woman in greek mythology can be um because you know funeral rites were women's duty um so that was her you know like doing what she was supposed to do um, the next one that he mentions, though, is Prometheus Bound, and this one plays into the whole Titanomachy, like, aspect of Percy Jackson, the Titan War, because Prometheus, he is a Titan, but he was on the Olympian side in the war, and um, so this play starts when he is getting punished for bringing fire to the mortals. Um, Zeus wanted to take it away. He didn't care about the mortals, didn't care if they survived. And so Prometheus, who takes credit for basically teaching them every art and skill that there is, like agriculture and music and all of that, he's like, no, I want to protect these people. And Zeus punishes him by chaining him to a rock where his liver is eaten and then it regenerates and it keeps getting eaten by an eagle. Um, so I wanted to read just a passage from it because I feel like it very much plays into Percy Jackson stuff. Um, and this is him talking about like his role in the war and stuff. Um, so he says, when, the, when first the gods began their angry, angry quarrel and God matched God in rising faction, some eager to drive old Kronos from his throne, that Zeus might rule the fools, other again earnest that Zeus might never be their king. I then, with the best counsel, tried to win the Titans, sons of Uranus and Gaia, but failed. They would have none of crafty schemes, and in their savage arrogance of spirit, they thought would lord it, um, would lord it easily by force. But she was, that was my mother, Themis, Earth, she is but one, although her names are many, had prophesied to me how it should be, even how the fates had decreed it. She said, not by strength nor overmastering force, the fates allowed the conquerors to conquer, but by guile only. This is what I told them, but they wouldn't vouchsafe a glance at me. Then with those things before me, it seemed best to take my mother and join Zeus's side. He was willing as we were, thanks to my plans, the dark receptacle of Tartarus conceals the ancient Kronos, him and his allies. These were their services I rendered to this tyrant, and these pains the payment he has given me in their requital. Um, this is a sickness rooted inherent in the nature of a tyranny, that he, um, sorry, like the language in this is so hard, that he that holds it does not trust his friends. So what all of that is to say is that um, he found out that the Titanomachy was gonna be won by wisdom, not by like any sort of 
fighting. And so he went to the Titans. He's like, use me. I am forethought. That's what Prometheus means. I will, I will craft a plan for you guys. They didn't have him. Zeus was like, okay, we'll take you in. But then, you know, like he kind of has this back and forth with Zeus. Most of, most of his mythology is about tricking Zeus. And so they have an antagonistic relationship. But because he sees himself as a friend to Zeus, having, you know, betrayed the Titans to be on their side in the war, he feels like this punishment is very unjust. And so he's saying Zeus is a Titan or is a tyrant and tyrants all eventually do the same thing. They're going to fall to somebody, but they're also not even going to trust their friends at some point, um, which we see is true in history, you know, like when you think of Stalin and and Hitler and stuff, they got so paranoid at some part of their rule that like they were even offing their friends. Um, so the um, what's interesting about him bringing that one up is that Zeus is very much the antagonist of the whole story. Prometheus does have his plan to help get back into Zeus's good graces, which is that he knows that there's a prophecy that a son is going to overthrow Zeus. I believe he might be mentioning, or he might be referring to, um, I think it's Athena's mom was supposed to have a son that would eventually overthrow Zeus. So that's probably what he's referring to there. And he was like, I have this prophecy in my back pocket. I'll tell Zeus what, and use that like to get free. Um, but yeah, like the whole thing is is basically Zeus is a tyrant and like this is how awful Zeus is. And the only way I'm going to get back in his good graces is this stupid little favor that's going to keep him in power. Um, and so I, I feel like that plays into Percy Jackson a lot because I mean, that's what we're seeing. The reason why we have two failed systems here, we have the Titans and we have the Olympians is because power eventually becomes corrupt when when you have power for power's sake. Um, and like, yeah, they're still in power at the end of Percy Jackson and there's still stuff that happens, which is why there's a whole other book series, I'm sure. But um, Zeus needs to be kept in check, essentially. <laughs> and um, Prometheus was a person who did that. And Prometheus does show up in Percy. He does. I, I haven't, I don't remember this. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure that he shows up in the fifth book, I think. I mean, yeah. I don't know about that, but I'm pretty sure that he does. But either way, um, it's just like the clear, like Percy would like a story like that, showing that even like the people that try to, um, that could have taken down the gods were not good people either. Mm hmm and so it's like, it doesn't matter. I don't like any of you because even, and that's very much something that's like reflective in our society, especially right now with yeah. the, like the U S election happening very soon is the whole idea of that, that like, just because somebody says something that you agree with, doesn't mean that they're a good person. Mm -hmm. This is just like the one time they said something that actually made sense. <laughs> Yeah, and there's like a difference between figuring that stuff out just just because they say that doesn't mean you're just gonna like completely go to like their side and give up everything else. Mm -hmm. And also we we have the theme in there of the whole reason he's being punished is for doing what's best for mankind and Percy is constantly doing what's best for mankind, you know, it's best for his people what's best for the demigods and not what's best for the Olympians. Oh yeah, some of my comments is telling me that I was right that Prometheus is in the last Olympian and of course it's a part where he's trying to tempt Percy. I vaguely remember that. Um that book has so many Lord. <laughs> There's so many things that happen in that one book that it's like hard for me to almost like keep track. <laughs> yeah. It's like, I really don't remember. I wish I did. But I'm, I, I'm honestly, I'm like excited about the fact that you don't, mm -hmm. because when we do eventually get to that book, like it, ha like the first chapter, mm -hmm. some, something huge happens in the very first chapter of the book. There is like no time wasted. Like Rick immediately is like, this book does not fuck around. This is serious. 
there's no like lead into it. It's just immediate, like immediately something gigantic happens in the first chapter that makes you want to like throw the book across the room because it's very upsetting, but it, it happens. Mm-hmm. And you're just like, shit. <laughs> like usually in these sort of stories, there's like a lead up, you know, to mm-hmm. it. Um, that's why I have it tied as with Titan's Curse as the best book and why most people consider it like the best book, even if they don't list it as like their favorite when they're listing it, but because it, it's just a crazy book like that. There's so, just so many things that happen. I legitimately have absolutely like the idea of them filming it on a TV show gives me anxiety <laughs> because it would be insanely good. Like if if people aren't watching the show by then, they will. Like that's why I kind of say I know I brought this up during like when we were talking about the bitchy Reddit and how ridiculous they are that I was like, I want you guys to like get this out of your system because I know that when we get to like seasons three, four, and five, you guys are suddenly going to be saying how great this show is, especially yeah. season five. Like there's like, like the, just what I remember, at least like 30 different people die in that one book, like in the last Olympian, including Luke. Um, but he's like the very last one. Mm-hmm. It's just like never ending. It's it's like how that sort of big one thing. This is a, so such a tangent. I don't care. One of the things from stories like this that bother me is kind of like when the big battle happens. Sometimes it happens so quickly, and it's just like it's just over, and it kind of makes you. It leaves you feeling like that was it. Like. Um, mm-hmm. I know I was one somebody who watched like the Marvel movie Endgame and felt like that like battle was really cool, but it didn't like it wasn't like this huge big epic thing like people imagined all of 10 years of stuff like leading up to. But like this book, um, that book really delivers on that where the entire book is just a gigantic battle. Mm -hmm. It just the first the first chapter, the thing happens. And then it just goes off from there and it never stops like for like days they're just in this gigantic battle walking around New York City where like everything is attacking them like every every everywhere they go like there's parts of that book where they're trying to figure out where to sleep for like two hours so that they can get sleep and there's people telling Percy like you need to stay here and sleep for a couple hours before when you have time to sleep because he doesn't have time to sleep. Mm-hmm. And it, so it's like, it's the kind of thing that would happen if you were actually, if this was really happening. And usually yeah. uh, stories like this just kind of gloss over that kind of stuff, but this one doesn't. It like shows how hard that stuff would actually be or to like how to find time to deal with it all when it's all just like happening. <laughs> yeah. Just, so, so like when I, re- when I read that book the first time, I read it like in one day. Like I read it in like 12 hours. I just like, I remember I went, I went, I had the day off of work in like 2012 and I went out and bought the book and it was still like in hardcover because it, that was like right when like the lost hero and son of Neptune had come out. And, but son of Neptune was like the newest book that was going to come out like that year, but mm-hmm. it hadn't come out yet. I remember that The Lost Hero came out and that was like the last book that I read and then I had to wait for them all to come out again. But I remember going, driving to Target, buying the book and then coming back home and it was like noon and somebody like messaged me on my computer and it sat there blinking for 12, over 12 hours. As I just, I kept seeing it and being like, I should answer them. And I didn't until 12.30 a.m when I finished the book because I like physically could not stop reading it. I was like, I can't do this, but it is like, it's that sort of a book where now when I'm reading it, I'm going to like, have to like take like a break at a certain point when I'm reading it, because it's so much is happening that you don't know how to like, even like ingest it all or like have time to even process it all as, Mm -hmm. and you're like, as the audience, you feel like that much less, how the characters will feel like on screen. And generally people already talk about that, like with the TV show, like how's the TV show gonna film a ginormous 
Yeah, the battle it, that just goes on and on and on and on and on and on. And like it, like there's like parts where it like stops, but it never, like it's it reminds me of like Game of Thrones, except well written. <laughs> like I remember like the seventh season of Game of Thrones. People talked about that. People loved the seventh season because they had like these huge epic battles and the whole season was like one long big battle with the like wind walkers, I think, and whoever was fighting them. And and that was the part when people were like, Game of Thrones is the best TV show ever. And then season eight came out and everyone cried because of how horrible it was. But it that's what it reminds me of, of like that, but like, with like emotional payoff and and things like that to go along with it that game of thrones never fully got at the time people thought that the battles were so cool that it was like the best show ever because of how good the special effects were and things like that um but the the storylines with like the emotions of the characters were never that great on that show um but that's what that that would that that's what that reminds me of and that's why people always ask the cast like like do you think about filming that sort of stuff? And they're all like, yes, but also, <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Like, how are we going to do that? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, like, even when they get to Titan's Curse, which is like so much sooner, like the junkyard, there's, there's things that get bigger and better. And like, it's just going to be so crazy. The amount that they're going to need to CGI and figure out and, I mean, hopefully Walker eats it all up because we know he likes the behind the scenes stuff. You know he will. <laughs> like that's that's uh, that's at least like the one thing that makes me feel excited about all of this. And even though I get like nervous, the nervousness for me is mostly about having to actually watch these scenes and expect to like function as a person after watching. Them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or like imagining like how hard filming some of these scenes will be like that i more think about that with walker filming this shit that seasons three four and five percy is just like going through it constantly there's never really a, a part where he like gets a nice little break there's like hardly any there's really none of that and so to be like playing a character where every single scene everything is falling apart around you would be a lot um yeah. so that's more what i wonder like how is He'll figure that out, but I'm also just list. I think about that of like, wow, that would be really hard to play a character like him, where every single scene you're in is like really heavy and mm -hmm. serious. When basically every other character gets a break at some point, like they because they're just not on screen as much, and so they don't have to do it as often. Um, but with him, it's just like all the time. Like Charlie is also obviously like that. But his character isn't on screen as much as as Percy is, so he gets a little bit more of a break. Yeah. <laughs> He's gonna be really going through it once we get to Titan's Curse. Yeah. Um, so uh, back to the um so the other tragedy that Percy's like, I would rather read this than Oedipus is the Trojan women, and this one's kind of a little bit of quicker explanation, but it's essentially the royal women of Troy after the city has fallen and you know they've they've lost their children they've lost their husbands they're um they're being taken off as war brides and so um we have Cassandra who is kind of like a Trojan princess I think she's the cousin of Hector um she is getting taken off by Agamemnon knowing she's about to die um, because his wife has been plotting his demise the whole time he's been gone at the Trojan War. And like, so they come back and there's actually the play, the Agamemnon, is literally him getting, yeah, um, stabbed. And um, so uh, then we have Andromache, who is Hector's wife. She gets given to Neoptolemus, who's um, Achilles' son, who eventually comes into the war. And Hecuba goes off with Odysseus. She is the queen of Troy. And we also have more death that happens within this. They see two children die, essentially. Astyanax, who is Hector's son. Um, the, the men of Greece decide that because he is of Trojan royal lineage, he's probably going to grow up and want to avenge his father. So let's just take him out now. Um, and... Then there's uh, Polyxena, 
who is a princess. She's the daughter of Hecuba and um, I'm Priam is the king's name. And um, she gets sacrificed as like a fair passage home type of thing to Achilles' grave. So um, she was kind of like his war bride in a sense. Um, and yeah, the whole thing is just, it's incredibly sad. You're seeing these women after their lives have fallen apart because of war. And I, I mean, like Percy is probably anticipating like what is going to happen when all of us, you know, go to war and some of us don't make it back. And so when he says these three tragedies, Prometheus bound Antigone and the Trojan women are more applicable to life, a little bit more relevant and a better read than than Oedipus Rex. I will agree. I hate Oedipus. I had to read it in so many freaking classics classes because it is used as a model of like, this is what happens in tragedies. But um, he's picking ones that really talk about war and specifically like, you know, what it's like to, you know, be a person that chooses humans and human morality over what the gods want, what it's like to, um, to be in some of these really, really heavy circumstances. Um, but moving on, um, this kind of opens up him talking about the prophecy to Paul. And it's, it's interesting hearing him talk about it because he doesn't know the prophecy, like he doesn't know the exact wording of the prophecy. It's been like ordered that nobody tell him, even though it's probably about him. And so um, he he tells Paul, someone's going to make a choice, and if they choose the wrong, if they choose wrong, the world will end. And Paul doesn't know that he's serious at first when he says this, but Percy's just like standing there. He's like, oh shit, he's he's not kidding. Um, and like, who's the prophecy about me? And yeah it's it's interesting um and paul kind of thinks to himself here i i tried to read the iliad by myself to to figure out what's going to happen to my stepson and i couldn't get through it because like it really is true in homer some of these battle scenes are very graphic it's like yeah the javelin went right through their mouth or and then blood spurted out like think quentin tarantino movie but like written out um where you know, the battles in um, Kill Bill. Yeah. Yeah. The, that, but written out. <laughs> that is what reading the Iliad is like at times. So the fact that he was able to be like, well, crap, that would be those, kill the, that would be those children. It'd be my stepson. It'd be all of his friends. Because we do see demigods falling on the battlefield in the Iliad. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I love this part because... I love this chapter because it just gets you start it starts off talking about like Greek mythology and then it like leads to this like super emotional stuff where Percy is like trying to act like strong mm -hmm. or I guess is the best word for it like he's trying to say the right things or to try to be like he's trying to almost like reassure Paul Mm -hmm. Like, he's trying to do the thing that he does all the time. Like, we just read him in Titan's Curse, reassuring literally everyone else instead of instead of anyone noticing about him. But except this time, Paul is somebody who actually cares about Percy first and doesn't care about the rest of this world. And so it's a totally different experience when he's sitting there trying to be like, don't worry about me. This prophecy is mine. It's mine. Mm -hmm. And even though he doesn't know what it says and they don't tell him the specifics of being stabbed to death until the very last book when they like basically have to mm -hmm. he still knows that it's that and the one the one line that always kills me from this part is when percy when paul is just like looking at him like how is this possibly going to be you and especially the way that this I think that Rick Riordan did a really good job with how he worded his prophecy because mm -hmm. it's so vague that it like is something that would absolutely drive you insane. Like mm -hmm. the idea that like you will make a choice and then however you decide 
that choice is what decides the fate of the entire world. And so it's not even like a thing of like it, there's no way you could know what that would be. Like, even though Percy knows who he's fighting and what will likely happen, and he knows it's going to happen when on his birthday, when he turns 16 and things like that, but he doesn't, there's no way that he could possibly, you make millions and billions of choices a day. There's no way that he could possibly know what the choice he's even going to make is that could possibly ruin the world. And it just makes, that's such an overwhelming thought to like know that something you could do one day could somehow destroy everyone you love and you don't even know what it is that you're going to do that makes that happen. And he's just telling Paul this stuff and Paul's like, how are you this small child who like lives with me and likes eating like blue candy and blue food that I'm like helping pass English class? How are you the one that has to make this gigantically huge decision? You're a literal child. Mm -hmm. And Percy's just trying to, he's talking to him the way he does everyone else. But like in the Greek God world, everyone's just like, yeah, whatever. Sure. Like they don't, they just like believe him and they don't like question more about Percy saying stuff like this because of how cutthroat that world is. But Mm -hmm. Paul is from like this world. Yeah. So he's like, this is so wrong that how how is it possible that Percy is the one that has to deal with this outrageously enormous, huge pressure? And like the part when when he's like, are you sure that you want this to be yours? If it isn't really yours, why are you saying that it is? Mm -hmm. And he basically says, like, Nico's too young of a kid that's been through too much. I could never do that to him. And he's like, you just described yourself, child. Yes. Like, yeah. yeah. Like there's, this is like a sidebar, but there's this one part from the Curse of the Triple Goddesses that just came out. And I'm not sure that people like necessarily caught on to it, but this is what I think Rick was doing. There's this one, I showed you like a screenshot I saw of this scene, but it's a scene when he's talking to, um, Hecate and he's and Percy is talking about like how I don't know how my mom is so brave to have another kid after having me and he's talking about how I've lost all of these people and every time I lose somebody I always get really sad and angry but then I just think about those people and how they would want me to feel and and it's basically him saying like his very actually okay like trauma responses and coping mechanisms of I use those people and remember them to like keep going mm-hmm. and keep trying and and it's just like a very sweet part of him talking about how he deals with all the people in his life that have died by that point in his life mm-hmm. and there's the end of that part is the like hellhound puppy that they've like that he had a mental breakdown over in that book is like the way that they put it in the book is that like the the puppy is like flopping on the floor and is like doing and Percy says like he's doing what puppies do laying there looking cute saying like please love me and I'm like Percy's doing that too Mm -hmm. saying you're adorable and very sweet and saying please love me while he's sitting there talking about the things that he does to like move on from all the people that he lost and I'm like you're just such a sweetheart (laughs) and it's just like something that you would only pick up on when you're older when you're reading these books because they're literal children that are going through this stuff and you have the right like we're old enough to like look at these kids as kids we're not kids reading these stories but that's what that like i love this chapter because paul's just looking at him and and he's probably the first person besides his mom that he's ever told this sort of thing to that has had like the correct response Mm mm-hmm that has been like, this should never be, how could this possibly be your responsibility? Are you sure about this? Because you deserve so much better than this to the point that Percy just like bursts into tears and starts sobbing at the end of the chapter Mm -hmm. because he can't like hold on to like trying to stay strong when somebody is just like, I I don't know how to describe this feeling, but it's because I've had conversations like this with people before about my own like, life stuff like all of the conversations 
Paul has in this fan fiction or with Percy, where Percy is like slowly telling him things, it reminds me of how when I meet new people and I like slowly just tell them random things from my life and they're always like, what? <laughs> and, and it's just like, you definitely have had that experience over the last like three and a half years or so. Every, every once in a while I just mentioned something and you're like, say that again. <laughs> like, what are you talking about? You've never mentioned this before. And I'm like, I'm sorry. I don't know when to mention things like this. And how do you bring these things up in normal conversation? I don't know how to do this. Um, but it, it just reminds me of that sort of experience of like, when you're telling somebody things like that, and they're actually looking at you with like the sort of like empathy that you okay. wish people would like give you, but they've never given it to you before. You don't know what to, you don't know what to do. Like yes. that was me going to therapy for the first time. Like my therapists were like acknowledging all of these things were really hard. And I was just saying them as if it was normal and fine and everything was great and nothing was wrong here and I'm fine. Everything's super fine <laughs> and all this stuff and then my therapist would be looking at me there's like therapy sessions i've had with every single therapist i've had so far where they like are crying or they're trying not to cry because therapists are not supposed to cry mm -hmm. um, but sometimes they're human and they can't help it and they and they do it a little bit and it like i like it when they do that because it makes me see like how bad these things actually are yeah that my like hardened trauma like like trained therapist that only sees people with super complex trauma is like trying not like desperately trying not to cry because it's that hard for them to hear. But like it's those sort of things that it's so much easier to just like act like you're fine when nobody gives like reacts to you. But then when you're standing there and you're telling this stuff to somebody who's actually looking at you with like real emotion, there's like nothing to stop all of the feelings that you like try to push down and they just like finally come out of him uh -huh. and it's just like I don't know what to do like what do you mean that Paul is like asking me all these questions of like but why is it you that has to do this yeah instead of like the gods arguing about who gets to kill him first and everyone else just being like yeah it's obviously going to be you anyway goodbye <laughs> instead, yeah. Paul is like are you sure though because you should you should make this decision for yourself yeah well, one of the things that I love in the characterization of him in this chapter is um, you can tell why he doesn't like Oedipus, and he, he basically says it, and it's because he owns his prophecy. He's like, this is mine, I'm going to accept it, and I'm going to try to make the right choice. Um, but Oedipus is a story of avoiding prophecy, so the, the basic plot is um Thebes is currently like cursed and Oedipus is trying to find out why he's been the king for a while he became the king because he defeated the sphinx that was originally terrorizing them um after you know making a journey there killing some old dude on the way that he didn't know who it was but they were in some sort of it, it sounded like road rage ancient road rage um and then because he killed the sphinx he are, I mean, he defeated the Sphinx. The Sphinx, I think, jumped off a bridge or something after he solved its riddle. But um, because he defeated the Sphinx, he was given the queen's hand in marriage. But then we slowly find out, as he finds out, that when he was a baby, he was born to the king and queen of Thebes. And he was prophesized that he would kill his father and marry his mother. And so the father just decides like, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna get rid of this baby, hands it to the mother after like pinning his feet together, which is why he's called Oedipus is like swollen foot is the translation. And the mother's like, I can't do it. I'm gonna hand the baby off to the servant. The servant was ordered to go leave baby Oedipus on a mountain for exposure. But he didn't. He handed him off to a um, shepherd, and the shepherd raised him. And so the whole prophecy comes to fruition because they avoided raising the baby. They avoided actually killing it themselves. And so because Oedipus grew up away from them, didn't know these people were his parents. So he didn't know that old man in the road raid in incident was his dad and fulfilled that part of the prophecy. And then when he was awarded the queen's hand in marriage, didn't know that was his mom. 
and that fulfilled that part of the prophecy. And so it is a story of the tragedy of what happens when you run away from faith. And I mean, even Luke, that's his basic story too, is his mom found out that like he was going to do some terrible things. She saw it and she went a little bit crazy and she was trying to avoid it. Hermes was trying to avoid it. Luke himself was trying to avoid it. I don't know how much he knew, but he he probably was trying to actively avoid it. And um, look at what he became. And he probably fulfilled every bit of what she thought he would become. Yeah. yeah it's like that story is exactly like that, where she, it's the irony that she did that to like find as much information as she could about his future so that she could help protect him mm -hmm. and then not only does having that the oracle stuff happen inside of her brain make her become like mentally ill but the one thing she sees is, is her son becoming like an absolute monster and so all these all those other years after that when he was with her she was afraid and knew that he was going to become that one day. And then when he asked Hermes about like, you know, do you know my fate? And he's like, yeah. And, but Hermes won't tell him the fate, like his fate, obviously that's never a good idea for anyone to know, no matter who you are. And, okay. um, but that just like enrages him more. It's like that whole thing of like, everybody knows this thing about me, but nobody will tell me what it is like that i do hate that feeling a lot when everyone else seems to know what's going on but you don't but it's that sort of thing that in somebody like luke that just became like resentment and anger and like wanting to like get like revenge basically on them for not being like i'm gonna prove to them that i'm the best that's ever been to like prove that these people being worried about me is wrong except that he fell right into what they saw yeah by being so obsessed with that and it's that like the story is a very good example like the oedipus rex stuff is a good example i don't know i don't know how to feel about how in a lot of like old stories and also even like up to now the scariest thing people can imagine is accidental incest <laughs> i just don't know how to feel about that that when usually it pops up in stories it's like seen as like the absolute worst thing that could possibly ever happen. like these people left their baby on a mountain alone to try to avoid doing this and it's like couldn't you have just like i don't know had proper boundaries with your child <laughs> like yeah. then this wouldn't have happened it's just such a weird it's weird for for me that's experienced it before to see the only time that it shows up in stories is when it's being depicted as like the most disgusting horrible backwards evil thing you can possibly ever imagine that you would rather leave like your newborn baby abandoned out in like the human elements than there be even a possibility that that would happen to you it's just so it just feels weird i can't yeah. remember what the other examples are but that comes up like the leaving a baby out to the elements and they don't pass away is is kind of a theme that happens in greek mythology but also, like, the my whole reason why I hate that play is had they just raised their child, what are the chances that that actually would have happened? Like, if he knew who his parents were, what are the chances? Maybe he would have still offed his father, who knows? But I don't think he would have married and had children with his mother. Um, and I, th I think that's a good thing to, that is comparable to Percy Jackson mm -hmm. in general, where not only with Luke, like there's the obvious with Luke that if Hermes would have just like gotten over his himself and been there or when Luke was growing up instead of being like, it's too hard to be around my son because he one day like will die. And it's like, get over yourself. Like they're a child. You should be in their life. Even if it's hard for you, you're the adult, get over your own feelings and be there for this child that doesn't know any better. Um, mm -hmm. If he would have done that and been around in Luke's life, Luke wouldn't have ended up the way that he was. But it's also just true in general, like how the the whole like pact they make, like the the big three gods of they find out that there's this prophecy that's going to come true one day where one of their kids is going to either save the world or like destroy it. And their reaction to it is like, okay, we're just going to stop having children. 
Mm -hmm. And it's like, what if you just like, I don't know, treated your children better? Like actually like took care of them, did all the things that Percy got you to do after he, you know, got you to listen to him finally? What if you just did all of that stuff in the 1940s and then it wouldn't, you wouldn't have had to stop having kids because you would have been taking care of them. Yeah. And so the kids that were around wouldn't be so angry at you that they would be willing to destroy the entire world to make you angry. Mm -hmm. But it's like they, they don't, instead, they're just like, we're just going to stop having children because we just, we could never take care of them. Oh my gosh, yeah. <laughs> It's so stupid. And also like the whole thing with Herbie's being like, oh yeah, I don't, I don't like your fate and I don't want to have to witness it. It's like, okay, stop having get Like, I mean, is there some sort of divine vasectomy here? Because uh, apparently the gods are incredibly fertile, you know? <laughs> like, also, like, are you five? Like, I don't like this thing. So I'm just going to avoid it forever. It's like, grow up. <laughs> yeah. Like you, like lots of people have to deal with things they don't like, but they don't like run away and stick their heads in the sand. They actually have to deal with it at some point. That usually is a better option overall if you just deal with it instead of just avoiding it until your son wants you to die. Yeah. And I mean, even though Percy's doing his normal self-sacrifice, his, his, you know, fatal flaw here, I do have to commend his mindset here because it is sound when you think of it. And when you think of how much he studied mythology and stuff, really the worst things happen when you are avoiding a prophecy about yourself. So why not just walk into it strong and say, okay, I know that I can make a choice that's either going to, you know, be good or bad. So I'm going to try really, really hard to make the good choice. Yeah. And it it's an overall theme in the Percy Jackson books like going forward too. like I know that there's a prophecy of course for the heroes of Olympus books mm -hmm. it, it that prophecy lasts a lot longer than you would think because you don't like I can talk about this stuff because it's so far away that it doesn't matter like it's not gonna you're not gonna know what any of this stuff means but it's basically the prophecy, of course, says that somebody is supposed to die. Mm -hmm. And there's almost every big prophecy like that. They always say something about how someone's supposed to die, of course. And so in the Heroes of Olympus books, it looks like a certain character is the one that dies. But then okay. that character ends up like coming back after like many months of everyone thinking that he's dead. Mm -hmm. And so because of the prophecy, another character ends up dying like many years later because that prophecy is still there one of those people are supposed to die and if that one kid comes back and he's not the one that's dead anymore then somebody else, like literally that kid dot like comes comes like back where he comes back when and is like suddenly alive again and in the time that he was gone and he comes back the other character dies and I, I know I told you about where it like mirrors the, the scene with Nico, where Nico walks in and asks like, where's Bianca? That the mm -hmm. character who comes back walks in and asks where the other one is. And everyone has to tell him that he just died because of him. And it's that whole thing, he died because of you. Like you came back to life and so he died mm -hmm. because somebody in this prophecy was supposed to die. And if you're back to life, then somebody else is gonna die now. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, it's, I like how Percy as like a series shows these things that sometimes the prophecies don't happen exactly how you think, like going into the last Olympian, you didn't think that the one that was going to stab himself to death was going to be Luke. And that's how that ended up going though. Like Percy didn't end up having to be the one to go through that. Thankfully, when everyone thought for all those years that it was going to be him, so, like, you didn't think that Bianca was going to be the one to die in the desert in Titan's Curse either. But it is a thing that this series is very much like, this is just something that's going to happen. And the more that you fight against it, the worse it is. Like, I liked how they did that in the show, how they start off, like, the big confrontation with Luke and Percy, with Percy just telling Luke, like, yeah, the prophecies always come true. And Luke is like, sometimes they don't. And he's like, no, actually, they they do. And he lists off every single way that the prophecy came true. And you can see, 
like when you know Luke's history and you watch his face in that scene, you can see him like trying to fight against it because he knows his own and he doesn't mm-hmm. want his own to be real. Um, but it is. And it from but like from that scene from the beginning, they just have it set like Percy knows, like, no, this prophecy happened this way. This is exactly what happened, even if a bunch of really weird stuff happened in between. So I'm not going to fight against it because this is obviously just good, just going to be what happens. Why would I fight against it at this point? Mm-hmm. And especially it's- like, I I do feel like it's one of those situations as, as traumatized people it's easier to do things on behalf of other people so this author picking up on like yeah he's basically doing it for nico and because he's carrying that guilt bianca is the first death he kind of witnesses um and so for him like that's the first big mistake i guess is is how i would put it and he just he can't let it go he can't let nico go knowing that i am the person and the reason why this this kid is so hurt even though that's not true yeah Um, yeah it's just so real to who he is and so yeah we have that chapter ending with paul just being like can i hug you and percy being like yeah and he melts in paul's arms Mm -hmm. um it's it's definitely the first time someone besides Sally has actually actually seen him. And also like the thing honest like I, I know I said this before like this book this fan fiction is a, a good way to know how to handle like teenagers. Mm-hmm. But it's really like it not only with teenagers but also with like traumatized people you get like 7 billion points from me at any point in my life, if you ever ask me, like, consent first, mm-hmm. can I hug you? Or is it okay to touch you? Or, or whatever, like, my mom does that sometimes. And that, like, when she, when my, when my mom and I started talking again last year, and she, like, the, I remember the first time I saw her, she, like, hugged me. And then when she didn't think she would ever see me again and then like left. And afterwards she messaged me and asked if it was okay that um, she hugged me or when she was like, can I tell you that I love you? And I was like, yes, you can. And, but it's like that, that's like the stuff that made me talk to her again because she was asking and she still asked me stuff like that. Like, is it okay if I tell Jerry about her, her boyfriend person about, like this story or is it okay if we do this or we do that or whatever just like the little like asking permission things means a lot because most people don't (laughs) ask about that stuff they just think that that stuff is okay but when you're traumatized especially with like people like touching you Mm -hmm. in any way you don't want that and so it's a good thing always to ask people that stuff first and it's just a very sweet thing that he asks even though Percy is about to like burst into tears, he still like asks him like, can I hug you? You can tell me no, basically is the like implied thing there. Like you can say no if you really don't want to right now. But of course he's like, yes, please. <laughs> yeah. Like, please actually give me comfort for once in my life. Yeah, um, so that closes out chapter four. I think we have enough time to do chapter five. I didn't take too many notes because like, it was long, but at the same time, it's so straightforward and so sweet. So chapter five is called The Strength You Hold Within. And the entire chapter revolves, revolves around the one way Paul feels like he can help Percy, which is through school. And it's like you said, it's a couple throwaway lines in the books. But here we have it actually written out how he helps him. So Percy in this chapter is in an English class with a teacher named Mr. Boring. And um, Mr. Boring is not uh, obeying his IEP. He's not doing any of it. So they slowly find out because Percy doesn't volunteer this information that he hasn't been given audiobooks, which is part of his IEP. His, um, he notices his worksheet is on white paper and because of the dyslexia, it's supposed to be on colored paper. Um, there was one more. Oh, um, they, uh, he finds out that Percy thinks he did really poorly on a midterm and the midterm was all written essay questions. 
And Percy is not only supposed to be able to dictate those, but like those kinds of questions, Paul thinks to himself are way too advanced for this level of an English class. Mm -hmm. And so this chapter is Paul advocating for Percy and trying to do it in ways that are respectful because Percy hates anybody fussing over him. So he's he's like, please, just like, we can ignore it. It's fine. I'll deal with it. Like, um, the teacher has been saying that my accommodations are unreasonable and impossible. And so, you know, like, Paul's just like right away, like, no. Um, he's been told that there's not audiobooks for the books that they're reading. And he's like, no, there are audiobooks for these books. I know they're there. Um, and so Paul's like, look. I know you don't want me to fuss, so let me go talk to him. Let me go talk to Stephen Borg. And um, he goes to Stephen's office, and this guy is the biggest fucking douchebag ever because he is talking about the IEP like it's special treatment. And he's talking, because Paul has, has advocated for Percy as his, his girlfriend's son, he's trying to be like, oh, you're trying to get special treatment for him for your girlfriend, aren't you? And um paul's like no the child has an iep these are accommodations it's not special treatment and it's his right like we have to obey these things and the teacher is just pushing back like nope nope this isn't gonna happen in the real world like um and so he's like i guess i have to go above your head don't i and so right after that happens um, apparently that happened during lunchtime and Percy had class with him after lunch, which Paul didn't know. We find that out in the chapter. And Percy is like, he alludes to the fact that Mr. Boring said something about it. And Paul's like, okay, what did he say? And he's like, well, basically he was talking about special treatment and it doesn't matter who you know. And um, so it was kind of obvious what he was talking about. And um, Paul like he sees that it's not okay like percy's not okay in this discussion but at the same time he's like look you need these accommodations and the only way we're going to get them is if we make a fuss at this point mm -hmm. so um and i i love that during this whole thing he's thinking about how like i can't help him with the monsters i can't help him with this prophecy that is weighing over his head um, I can't do anything with the mythological world that terrorizes him day in and day out, but I can do something about this and I'm going to do something about this. Mm -hmm. This this chapter is my favorite one of this <laughs> fan fiction because um, ableism is everywhere. Yeah. That's what this chapter essentially is. There's so many people that I run, like, run into that say stuff like that, even sometimes even people who think that they wouldn't or like don't even realize necessarily what they're saying they say things that are similar to that like um i've been thinking about this lately because i just started a new work from home job that i absolutely hate but i need to do it in order to not be homeless and so i'm doing it and when i tell people about how it's a work from home job like they sometimes have the reaction of like oh you're lucky that you get to work from home or I would love to have a job where I could work from home. And it's like, this is literally the only kind of job I can do. Mm -hmm. Like I probably wouldn't last in a job in person because I have enough problems doing a job like that when it's online and all the interactions with people are over a computer. There already are issues every day of misunderstanding what they're saying or, or whatever. Um, with autistic stuff happening and also trauma stuff happening. I got through all of school, not only with like my absolutely insane, like family situation with my dad happening, but then also I was also autistic all those years too. And somehow nobody ever figured that out through <laughs> all of the schooling. I'm pretty sure that I also have like dyscalculia, which is something that you can get when you're autistic, which is, it's kind of like, the inverse or opposite or whatever of dyslexia where instead of like words you have problems with numbers um, i just don't remember them i failed math from like fourth grade to college when i stopped having to take math 
almost there were like two classes that entire time that I passed and it was because they were taught by it was classes that were meant for people that were bad at math. Um, but even now, like the other day at my new job, we were doing like a little bit of math and I got every question wrong. <laughs> and I was just sitting there so mad, like this is just always going to be like, this is so annoying that I can like never figure this stuff out. But it's one of those things of like all from fourth grade to 12th grade, I failed math from fourth grade to like 11th grade every single year. And nobody ever like thought, sat there and was like, maybe there's something else going on <laughs> that this like student just failed math every year. And for like with Percy, it's like everyone just assumes that because he's dyslexic, he's just stupid. And that's why he just like fails English because he just can't do it because he's dyslexic. And it's like, no, he can do it. He's actually smart about this sort of stuff. He's a, a smart kid. It's just that no one's ever given him the right sort of environment for him to succeed the way that everybody else does. And so it's so nice to read Paul, especially there's a certain point in the story where, um, <laughs> where he, because he's failing this one teacher's class, of course, because the teacher's a giant dick. Um, he is, he can't do like, he can't play on the basketball team at school because of that grade. Really? And I love that part because Paul is like, absolutely the fuck not. Or is this asshole little teacher going to take basketball away from my stepson, who is a walking trauma response? This is like something that he actually gets to do that he enjoys, that is fun for him. He actually gets to do something that's a part of like normal people stuff. You are, oh. I'm not letting this stupid ass teacher who's just an ableist little jerk take this away from him. And it's yeah. just so nice to read somebody doing stuff like that. I've told you a little bit of Jake's history before. So my husband had a lot of trouble in school, like K through 12 school. He did get through chiropractic college by the skin of his teeth, but like um, his mom was kind of that way too. Um, he was in band for a while. He really loved trumpet, but he had to drop it because of grades. Like you couldn't actually be in band with like the grades that he had. And um, he was in roller hockey, which um, that was considered a club sport. It's not an official sport, which means the grades didn't necessarily matter as much. And um, so there would be people when he was struggling being like, oh, you should take away hockey. You should take away this. You should take away that. And his mom was like, no, <laughs> like, I'm not going to take away the good things when he's having trouble. Like, what? And, and why would I do that? Yeah. And so, yeah, Paul remarks that um, Percy's never been on any sort of team sport. He's never been able to do this. And he just happened to like it when he was playing horse with Paul. And like, it was like, okay, let's, let's do this. Um, so, and the other thing that I really love that Paul acknowledges is he asks him to see the midterm that he failed on. Um, and we know the grade in this this particular fan fiction. He got a 56 out of 100. But on the questions he did answer, Paul's like, I can tell you understood what you did read, what you were able to take in. Because Percy says the reason he thinks he got a bad grade was because since the teacher wasn't following the accommodation with the audiobooks, it was taking him too long to read. And he just didn't finish the reading. Um, so, yeah, Paul, Paul sees... He's really smart. He does get it. He, he like actually can take it in when he has the right tools. And so Paul super advocates for him. And then that doesn't necessarily work out one on one with the teacher. They go above the teacher's head. And um, I forgot what the name of the official was. It was something like core counselor or something like that. Um, and he sets up the meeting. Sally and Percy go without him so that like we don't get the details of it, but we do get like Paul walks into Percy and Sally happy and Percy's like, yeah, mom eviscerated Dr. Borg <laughs> and like, um, just like we know, knowing Sally, she probably went off on like, no, this is not special treatment. Do not freaking treat my son like this. And, um, then like the teacher eventually comes into Paul's office later and is like, 
oh, so you tattled on me? And he's like, yeah, and you better not take it out on my stepson. <laughs> like, like, you mean that I got the school to follow his IEP, which would be against the law for you not to follow? And the teacher's just like, mm. <laughs> yeah. So, so that was just like, it was such a cute and sweet little chapter because it is a detail we know happened. We just don't get the full story of it. And we do like, I know you've mentioned that Percy eventually goes on to college. That's kind of like where it's heading. And this is how he gets there. Someone finally being like, this is what my son needs. And we even get like in his head, he's, he's already saying like, I'm this child's parent. I am his father in a way. And it's just so pure and so sweet and it's exactly what percy always needed mm -hmm. and i the parts of this chapter i really like is the part in the very beginning when paul is asking him questions of, and realizing from the way that percy's answering that he doesn't have any accommodations and he was just like i don't want to make a big thing about myself and so mm -hmm. but like just the way that whenever Paul asks him a question and Percy just kind of like stands there for a second, like he looks confused or like he's answering, but he almost sounds like unsure about what he's saying. It's that <laughs> I've had that experience so many times of like people just asking me things and giving them my honest answer. And the way that you answer like gives away like something about you that you don't mean to be like exposing to people and that's basically that that whole every conversation that paul has with percy that whole that whole chapter especially is that just happening of him of paul being like wait but you're supposed to get help and percy being like but i thought that i'm supposed to get nothing and just like try to make it work anyway isn't that how that's what every other teacher i've ever met before has told me so how is it possibly any different than that now and it's like oh because this teacher is actually ethical <laughs> mm -hmm. and and cares about disabled students when i mean the thing that sucks about this is most of the time in life they don't care like not yeah. even just outside of school like i i like learning things but i hate school i'm not, i no like if if I could go to like college classes just to learn stuff and they and it wasn't that expensive, I would do that because I just like learning stuff, but I don't want to do it where I have to actually like follow rules or anything. I just want to go to go. Mm -hmm. um, but that kind of stuff even happens at jobs like your job will do like some huge presentation about how um, they help disabled people or how they follow like the mm -hmm. rules that they're supposed to. And then you'll, if you're me anyway, you'll email them and ask them to let you miss some of your work so that you can go to your therapy appointment every week and they'll tell you no. Oh, um, <laughs> did you actually do that yet, by the way? No. <laughs> like a physical accommodation process with, um, I was working for a university for a time and I had one really cool boss who just let me work from home. Like it was off the books. It was, it was her own accommodation, which like, my dad at HR was like, well, that that's retroactively an actual accommodation. They should honor that. But then um, when I got a new boss and she's like, no, you can't work from home. Um, I tried to go through the accommodations process and they wanted all of these things. They wanted me to get see a new doctor to get a diagnosis because I went from like a whole year trying to get a diagnosis for my digestive problems and got nothing. And so I don't even have like an on paper diagnosis of what's going on with me. And at that point I had revived myself from being 80 pounds and like starving to death because I couldn't keep food down. And I, all I knew about myself was I had these new food allergies. And so, um, like they really, really we're trying to push like, you know, you have to go to a traditional doctor because the only people that helped me were naturopathic and um, like not traditional doctors. <laughs> and um, they, they were like, oh, so if you've had so much trouble, we'll set you up with the doctor. We'll try to make it happen. Never, never came to fruition. They, they never actually got me that appointment with the gastroenterologist that they, they promised me. 
And then COVID happened and I got to work from home anyway. And the boss who had pushed for this the entire time, thinking that I was trying to get out of working with the team or something, like I ended up being her right hand man because I was the only one who could function so well working from home. Um, and, and it was like, yeah, you need me to do something cool. I'll do it. And it was done in like two seconds. And, um, so she eventually was like, yeah, okay. I was, I was trying to go by the books. I'm sorry. Um, and it, I mean, that situation worked itself out because with COVID by the time I quit that job, they weren't fully back in person, but, um, yeah, that, that was a whole adventure and that sucked. It sucked. And like the, when I tried to go to my own doctor to get something, she was like, well, I could say you're anorexic and that's why you can't go to work. And I was just like, what? Oh my God. Yes. No. And I, I remember, uh, when we became friends that you were still working at that job for a while. And I remember a couple of times you telling me how they, there is like job, like meeting things at like Applebee's or something. And you would go and you could have like absolutely nothing, mm -hmm. like nothing. You could have like water and yeah. like a side of broccoli. And so you just get nothing. And I was just like, this is fucking stupid. Yeah. That they're like making you go and having you come and they don't, and you, and you can't even eat or drink anything at all. And it's like, and it's how this reminds me of what I just said is that I'm part of what I'm afraid of with this job is that they're going to ask me for like official documentation of some sort for at least the autism side because i've never gotten an official diagnosis and i don't want to um mm -hmm. i don't need it and like the dvr didn't even ask me for an official one they just um my therapist just said that she is she just hasn't gotten officially diagnosed and that was good enough for them mm -hmm. um to go forward and to like that's that's it they didn't need anything else but I'm afraid a job like that is going to ask me for all of that documentation and I don't have any and I definitely can't afford it, even if I, but even if I could afford it, I don't want to do it. Mm -hmm. And so I would just like sit there and cry for a while because it's like, I know that I am. Why do I need like some stranger to tell me that I am who doesn't even know me just for you to give me this stuff like, have you ever watched me on camera? not look at the camera ever <laughs> and like every time they like read something off i just like stare off at the wall or like off to the side to or <laughs> there was one day i picked up one of the like small painting things i made that were, that's only like this big that has like texture on it and i just was like holding it and like touching it <laughs> or like i picked up my squishmallow is like right next to my desk because i was just hugging it for like hours during training sometimes as a way to like deal with when I felt like overwhelmed and I like couldn't like turn off my lights or anything. <laughs> and I was just like, do you really need like a stranger to say that, that I am after watching that happen in front of you? <laughs> um, but they probably will, which is uh, the thing that is always scary about this stuff. Like it shouldn't be this hard or you shouldn't be scared of, of just telling somebody something like that and how they're going to react to you. Um, cause it's like, you, you do what you can to like figure out how to survive, um, in a world that doesn't want you to be like that, especially when it's invisible sort of disabilities mm -hmm. where they can't, where they just like, can't tell. Like, I know with people like with you, people probably would never know about all of your like food gastro issues if you never brought it up mm -hmm. I get like really angry just thinking about that <laughs> yeah. well and it's so stupid that like uh, similar to this teacher in the chapter that they'll act like certain accommodations really are impossible and unreasonable when they're not like they're very much not um we all were able to figure out working from home during COVID and a lot of people were way more productive. Uh, so what are you saying that this is unreasonable, that you need people in office? That's bullshit, I'm sorry. There's no office today where you do things mostly on a computer 
that you need to be in in their building like it doesn't make sense to me yeah like or like a example for me today for like the complex ptsd stuff is um my mom showed me this she had like a bunch of old pictures of us Mm -hmm. (laughs) when i saw her this weekend and she showed me the picture she had of me when i was like a newborn baby and i look a lot like my dad in that and so my reaction was literally just staring at it (laughs) because i didn't know like what to think because and like she didn't know how to react because she did i obviously didn't tell her that (laughs) um but that's what i was thinking and so today all day today at work i was like i don't want to look at my face today but i had to because i had to have my stupid webcam on because i guess if you work from home they think that you're never going to do your job if they can't literally watch you the entire time that you're doing it and i was just thinking the entire day like this would all be so much easier if i didn't have to like look at myself all the time like i don't want to look at myself all the time and if i tried to ask them can i not look at myself sometimes because it reminds me of my super abusive dad and then i don't pay attention to what you're saying because i'm thinking about him instead um they would just say are you dramatic (laughs) or something like that they would just be like everybody has to deal with difficult things and i'm like do you want me to info dump on you about my life (laughs) like i will if it it will like shame you into something it won't it would just make you look at me in a very strange way and that's all that would change Mm -hmm. um but it's those moments where you just wish that people would just do it without or i guess look at that stuff as like you're not you're not trying to be difficult Mm -hmm. and it's i know that like amani on tiktok talks about this a lot with like disability accommodation stuff is that whole thing of like if you give disabled people accommodations it makes everything easier for you too who don't need them and it would make your life easier because if we get accommodations like that because we have disabilities then it means that you could also ask for those same sort of things during your work day that would make your day easier. It, even if it's not because of a disability, you could still get it. Mm-hmm. But like they instead are just like mad that we're getting it at all. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, we I just thought ch- we can move you into Paul's class for next semester. Um anyways, I, I have to get William to bed. Um did did the D23 thing already happen really quick? No, no not yet. yet. Okay, but before next one, right? No, it's after the election. Oh, okay. It's on, it's on, um, it's like the weekend after the election. It's on November 8th. So like not this weekend, but next weekend. The one thing I can say for like the TV show is that some of the cinematography people posted that at the location that is very obviously Holly Themis's island. Mm-hmm. And so, um, that was like pretty much verified because Becky, of course, on threads responded to somebody like a fan talking about like why they would be filming that now because the weather is about to be too cold for them to be outside where they would do it now um, mm-hmm. before it gets before it starts snowing. And she replied saying that like the first day they had snow during season one was like November 6th or something, which is very normal for like the northern, like, I live in Wisconsin, and even though I live far away from Vancouver, I think we're actually more north than Vancouver somehow, Mm -hmm. Um, and that's a very normal amount of time to have, like, your first snow, and so, yeah, uh, either way, it, that would be interesting (laughs) for them to, like, I think they just, like, rushed forward to film whatever scenes they have to do for that stuff outside, um right now and that's probably like the last scenes they're going to be filming outdoors Um, so that's fun yeah i'm super curious if it was just like a fun little thing so the actress who plays talia she did a little dress up as grover like she was wearing i don't know if it was it's a short wig or what but um it was definitely like her trying to be grover i'm so curious what that's about like i (laughs) I'm curious if that's a filming thing or her just goofing. I think it was her having fun to like promote Dior's song, but either way, it was really funny. And it makes sense that like her and Arian would be hanging out more because they're the two that aren't in as many scenes as everybody else. 
<laughs> but it was either way, it was really funny. And there's those things. And then one thing that I thought was kind of nice is the kid, his first name is Gordon. I can never remember his last name, who plays um, Aang for Avatar The Last Airbender. They're also filming right now. And so they're all up in Vancouver together. And the kid Gordon just turned 15. And him and Walker have like hung out at least a few times in mm -hmm. the last like week or so. And I'm like, well, that okay. thank God for that. Because like Gordon's like 15, Walker is probably like six months older than him. It has to be an extremely rare experience to be playing a character that so many people love and there's like gigantic expectations and you're the star of the entire show when you're 15. <laughs> yeah. So I'm like, well, thank God those two kids can like talk to somebody else who knows what that's like. That must yeah, be yeah. so nice for both of them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, that's cool. I, I just wish they were doing better with Avatar. I mean, I hope yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping season two is redemption for Avatar. I hope so too. I just, the whole t so I don't I, we never mentioned this on here I don't think the top thing that they yeah. retroactively like, yeah, like the thing yeah. I'll say about that is that like when they they did this whole thing where they announced that they were going to do a casting call to find a disabled person to play Toph but they announced it two months before they were going to start filming so I was like this isn't a real casting call because those things take like a really long time like the Percy casting calls were for like over a year before they cast anybody. That's okay. usually how long it takes, at least like six months of looking at people. If you're looking for people that you don't know already, that aren't like mm -hmm. actors that are well known or whatever, which is what they made it sound like. And then they ended up casting a girl who's the girl is not the problem, obviously, but mm -hmm. she's in no way like disabled or blind or seeing seen impaired in any sort of way. And they're mm -hmm. like, oh, we got her a coach to like learn how to look disabled and things like that. And it's like, you could have just cast someone who was disabled where you wouldn't need a coach to teach them how to act disabled in the first. But it was this whole thing of, the thing that also made a lot of disabled people get mad is that they deleted all of their tweets and stuff that they made about them doing that casting call as if if they just deleted them all that we would just forget that it happened. June was only three months ago oh when that news broke. <laughs> like the, we remember June. <laughs> and like it was and I saw people saying that and I like went on Twitter and the only accounts that I could find of like people tweet like showing like the casting call and stuff were fan accounts. And all of them that like retweeted the like new showrunner woman who was posting it it was all post post deleted post deleted and i was yeah. just like that is absolutely wild that they just tried to delete all of the posts they made saying that they were wanting to cast somebody who was seen impaired and then just like obviously had that other girl in mind the entire time and likely did that to try to look like they tried to find somebody mm -hmm. um so that doesn't give me like the best feeling. <laughs> yeah, Toph's such an important character. She is yeah. such an important character. So it's it's really disappointing. I feel really bad for all of the kids on Avatar The Last Airbender because it seems like a very chaotic production. Mm -hmm. um, like the one showrunner that did season one is now an executive producer on Percy Jackson season two. And the two new showrunners that took over are doing this stuff now. And so it just, it doesn't seem like one that has had a lot of planning or whatever put into it in the way that Percy does. And it's like those kids deserve to have a nice time, like all the Percy kids do. Yeah. It doesn't seem like, there's no way that they could, just because of how chaotic. Fans are going to be mad. Like, uh, and I mean, fans were mad, so it's it sucks. It really sucks for them. Yeah. Yeah, but anyways, I gotta go. I hear my little Yoshi stomping around again. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, are we gonna finish up this fan fiction or are we gonna pick another one? I don't know if it starts getting a little spoilery. Uh, well, I'll probably find another one because the chapters going forward are after the last book that gave away like everything. <laughs> and, and so we'll I'll find some other ones we can read, but we're at least in the next couple weeks going to read fan fictions before going into 
um, the next book because it's fun to do that. Yeah, and also we need some levity after how Titan's Curse ended. Yeah, we're going to need some levity after Titan's Curse and before we go into Battle of the Labyrinth because that book is also ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we will catch you guys next week with another fan fiction.